Can you hear? Is that right? Um, I will. I will not be leading. I will be following. But uh, <laughs> um, I should. I should say that uh, Pico Iyer is here for uh, very selfish reasons, and that is that um, I saw him a few years ago at the Arkansas Literary Festival, and I was already a, an admirer of his writing. And then I found out uh, that he is so eloquent um, that I, I, I simply wanted, him, wanted to find an opportunity to get him into an Oxford American event so that I could find out more about his thinking because um, the session in, in uh, Little Rock uh, couldn't cover everything. And uh, I won't be able to cover everything in, in this interview, but um, I, I hope to give you all uh, some uh, insight <coughs> to this uh, remarkable uh, man and writer. I think he's a, a great uh, prose stylist. I think he is a, um, a, 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 I don't feel like I, I should be judging this, but I think he's a great soul. And, um, and it's just wonderful to have him up here. Um, there's no book of his that I wouldn't recommend. And uh, after this, uh, session, I, I, I would uh, advise you to uh, have Pico uh, pick up a book and have him sign it. You'll not, you'll not regret that. Um, and oh, the last thing I'll say is that this, this uh, interview, will, uh, you know, we're filming it and we'll transcribe it and uh, share it with uh, as many people as possible. So um, uh, we'd better be uh, on, <laughs> on our game. Um, so here we, here, here we go. I, I am so excited. I, I am intimidated, but uh, what the heck? Okay, well. You know, I just want to say how, <laughs> how pleased and proud I am to be part of the Oxford American clan. I mean, it was only a year ago that we met, and I feel so welcomed. And no one, especially my wife and mother, has ever called me a great soul before. So really? this afternoon is a success already, as far as okay. I'm concerned. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, Pico, uh, wh why do you write? to make a clearing in the wilderness is the first thing that comes to me, which is to sort out what I think, what I care about, to make sense of the rush of experiences and emotions, impressions that come in on us all this day. It's, uh, it's the only way that I can sort of guide my life and prepare for it. The way some people wake up and take a three mile run, and some people meditate, some people cook. I begin the day in that kind of sanctuary that is the desk. Uh, processing everything, and whether it's my meeting with you last year or some tangle in my life, whatever is going on, I feel that the only way I can make sense of it is to put it down on the page. Once it's outside me, I can make a better shape and sense of it. And the more that I work and tunnel into that theme or episode or dilemma, the clearer I can think of it. You know, most of us have a hive of bees inside our head. And they're swarming in there, and there's no way we can see really what's going on. And writing is a way of clarifying that. You know, Graham Greene, who's a recent fascination of mine, said he couldn't understand how anybody s remained sane without being able to write. For him, it was what kept chaos at bay. So when you say to make a clearing in the wilderness, you mean your wilderness and not necessarily the world's wilderness? Or Both, or maybe. Okay. Uh, let's say I'm walking through New York City for five days or Beirut for five days. And all that's coming at me is a rush of, of, of impressions and, uh, that each are contradicting each other at every moment. And after five days in New York or in Arkansas or in Beirut, I want to think, where have I been? What have I understood? How has this sent me back a different person than I was before? Right. And without the discipline and the clarity of writing, I think that would be really difficult. And like anybody, sometimes I try to take myself on a holiday. So I say, put the notebook away, just enjoy being in the Rockefeller Institute for three days. And it's wonderful, but I find it's a much deeper and more engaged and more fulfilling conversation if I take out my notebook. Because then suddenly, I'm noticing things that I wouldn't be noticing otherwise. It's almost as if I'm flicking a switch in my mind that says on. All the senses are on you at super alertness, and you're asking questions of the place. And you're, as I begin writing, new things come to me that I want to know about Little Rock last year or the Rockefeller Institute today. And it becomes a real conversation, like meeting a fascinating stranger and you talk to her for 18 hours into the early hours of the morning uh, to really find out who she is and how she can change you. And that's sort of whatever my experience is, the notebook is my way to 
begin and go deeper into that dialogue, I guess. Um, do you, I mean, do you have the same? You're an editor, but you're a writer too, and you must have the same experience. Absolutely not. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> um, is writing an art or craft? It's a craft. Um, and it's a science too, probably. But you know, one thing that's taken me the longest time to learn is how much of writing takes place a long way from the desk. And I was just writing about it actually last week. When I began writing, I thought it was all about sitting at the desk, making beautiful patterns with words, mm. creating an intricate kind of embroidery, setting up an outline, using your notes, putting something from here, some a note card from here next to a note card to there. And of course, that is a large part of it. But I found, as the years go on, that a lot of my best writing may take place when I'm taking a walk here, or when I'm playing ping pong, or watching a baseball game, or talking to you. And there are certain invisible but substantial changes with whatever you're working on that can only take place when you're far from your notes and far from your desk. Because when you're hovering over your piece of paper, your laptop, or whatever it is, you're one kind of person able to put all the minute details into a kind of order. But you can only really see the larger picture when you're not looking at it. Um, the way that you know, somebody who's important to you, sometimes you can only see her when you're on the other side of the world. Um, so for example, with my last book, when I finished it, I put it aside for a whole year before sending it to the publisher. Because I thought nothing bad will happen to it. Nobody's rushing to read my latest book. It's not very topical. And yet something invisible may take place in those months that's going to transform it. And sure enough, eight months after I set it aside, I was walking along the hills of California. And suddenly I thought, instead of having eight chapters, why don't I just make them nine? Exactly the same content. So, but suddenly it becomes an entirely different book. And it suddenly forms into three sections of three chapters each. So I didn't change a single word in it. but. Just that change, which I could only really think about and come up with when I was a long way away from the desk, uh, seemed to me to transform the book more than nine months of adding 40,000 words would have been. Um, I mean, I, I do find that inspiring when we hear from great writers who are not in a, ru a rush to publish. They're in mm. a, 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 a rush, if that's the word, to perfect. And, mm. and, and I, I love that. It's taken me a long time to come there, because like um, Mr. Whitworth yesterday, I began in journalism. And so when I began writing books, I was into the, in the journalistic routine, which is write it as quickly as possible, get it off, and move to the next thing. Clear your desk and clear your mind. So it's taken me 20 years, finally, to realize that um, in writing, you're really taking a substantial piece of your experience, your imagination, and putting it out there forever. Right. And given that, it's much better to do justice to that three years from now, then yeah. push it off now. Um, and I, I also feel that the, you know, the market has, has, has changed these days. And uh, before, there was a sense of, um, <laughs> I have less a sense of multitudes waiting at the bookstore to buy the, the latest book, not just by me, but by anyone. Right. And that actually liberates one in certain ways to, to get the book right. But you also, you also know that your readers care about what you have to write. And probably, even if they don't know, the care you mm -hmm. t uh, and the patience you take in, 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 in getting, getting it right in your mind, um, they're the ones who care about it. Even they if are, they, Even yes. if it's not the multitude, it's the people who care. That's true. And therefore, for them, too, I'd rather give something that, that's right than right. something that's quick. Right. Uh, and also, I mean, it's an interesting thing with readers. Uh, I have a very wise editor. And I said to him a couple of years ago, I love going to places like the Oxford American Summit, because you will meet people who read your books and right. find out that they meant a lot to them. And he said, that's fatal. Because <laughs> the more you meet appreciative readers, the more you're uh, congratulated for things that you have done, and the easier it is to be in a rut. And so he was saying, better not to meet the people whose lives you've made better with your prose, because then there's a stronger temptation to give them what you know you can give them. Uh, and it, at least it was an interesting <coughs> counterintuitive position, and especially good from a, a, to hear from an editor, because you right. assume the publishers want to turn authors into stereotypes so that they can market them, so right. that they, they're brandable. But he was almost giving me the opposite advice, which is write what you can't do, take yourself where you haven't been, right. and make sure you're not 
giving even the readers who care something you've given them already. Well, your, your, your Dalai Lama book wasn't a copy of your previous Good. work. Um, Good. No, that was the aim. I mean, I almost hope each book will be a contradiction or a refutation right, of the previous right. one. So, so when, when I think, when I, I'm not sure I'm a travel writer in the sense of being interested in physical travel, because right. I'm not so much. Right. But in the sense of that restlessness and wanting to take on the next challenge, wanting as a writer to look around the next corner, there I'm certainly a traveler. And I, if I find something that I sort of know how I, I can do, how to do, then I want to move on to something I don't know how right. to do. Um, well, are, are, are the skills that uh, one uses in travel writing applicable to any, to any form of writing? Yeah, and because I, I was actually saying it to Wes at lunchtime, my definition of a travel writer is someone who would never want to be called a travel writer <laughs> and who probably isn't so interested in travel, whether it's Jan Morris, who's a historian, or Bruce Chatwin, who's an anthropologist, or Paul Theroux, who's a novelist, or Jonathan Rabin, I was talking to with Eva at lunch, who's really uh, an essayist. Whatever it is, um, travel is just, uh, just the ostensible topic. And you know, right. probably 95% of what I write is not travel related. It is essay-ish of some kind. Right. Uh, and so I would be turning to Hazlitt or Emerson or right. Joan Didion or Hunter Thompson or you know, those would be the models I would be looking towards probably. Uh, so it's the same, I, I think it doesn't matter whether I'm writing about Mark or I'm writing about the Dalai Lama or I'm writing uh, a piece about Little Rock. It's exactly the same process in each in case. In, in, in which way, if you could explain that just a little bit further. Uh, that in each case I would be taking lots and lots of notes okay. by hand in a, in a handwriting I probably can't read so okay. a lot of my most creative word choices would come from misreading my handwriting. Um, I would take all the notes then and there so if I wanted to write about this event as soon as it was over even though we're both going to the River Rock Grill I would say oh, excuse me Mark I just need to go to the restroom right. and I would be doing that not to relieve myself, but to scribble down <laughs> everything as quickly as okay. possible while I could remember exactly how that photo went or that painting went with that painting right. and exactly the blue of this gentleman's shirt and exactly the smell and feel. Because if I leave it even an hour, it'll be gone. Is that true? It is, is it, true. It, it, it is true. I mean, I find it to be the case. And uh, you know, I think experience is much more like a dream than sometimes we imagine. You, and all of us have that sensation of suddenly being jolted right. into semi-wakefulness at two in the morning right. and you've had a very powerful dream and if you write it down almost with your eyes closed you'll cover maybe a whole page wait even ten minutes and you barely can do a paragraph right. wait till That's the next right. morning you can't even remember you had a dream or what right. it was right. and experience isn't quite that that strong but it is to some degree so I take everything down then and there if I were writing about you or Little Rock or, um, or the Dalai Lama and then at some, then I would ultimately take it back to my desk in Japan, maybe allow it to sit for a few hour, uh, for a few months for memory to sift out what really had touched me deepest. And then begin to shape it and to try and think about what was the most powerful thing about the experience, whether I should make that the beginning, the middle, or the end. And, uh, and then start worrying about the art and the craft and the tech technical part. And the, that, that note taking, I, I, I suppose, relieves the pressure of having to remember yeah. the, the minutia, yeah. which yeah. in the end actually helps your writing. The minutia makes it in, but, but you can focus on other matters. Right? Exactly. And especially their travel writing poses particular demands, because if you go to North Korea and you want to write about it, you, it's too expensive and too difficult to go back. So you have to get it all right. down the first right. time. Uh, but what I found is my relation with notes has changed dramatically um, over really? the years. So it used to be that I would take, let's say I'd spend two weeks in, in, in a country, and I would take maybe 200 pages of notes. And those are not little fragments. I, they would be whole paragraph okay. mini essays okay. that I would write up. So I'd, I'd take down all the details then and there right. in full sentences. And then in the evening when I got back to the hotel, I'd write it up as if I were writing a five-page essay. So okay. I'd go home with a lot of, lot of notes, very, very concrete, about the, the look and smell and every last road sign and every last song I'd heard and all of that. And having gone to the trouble of taking the notes, I'd feel, now I've got to inflict them on the writer. Right. And so I'd put them all in. Now, uh, I would take those same notes, but when I go back, um, I would leave those notes on the other side of the room. And I would try to write from memory or from emotion or imagination. 
and try to follow a current much deeper than I could get from the notes. Interesting. And then if I needed to know whether there was red trimming or pink on your sneakers' laces, I would have that there and I could turn to that at the end of the process. But I would, I would start by not being distracted by the notes, but what's deeper than the notes. And I actually, I mean, I had an interesting experience in that re regard because in the mid-80s, I went to Cuba and was instantly fascinated by it, as anybody would, and went back three months later and kept on going back and very quickly got deeply involved in the lives of many Cubans. And the kind of Cubans who meet people from the US are usually ones who want to escape. So they were all right. asking me if I'd marry them or if I'd give them my passport or if I'd get them a job with the CIA, all kinds of things. Uh, oh. But one of them, who was the most intelligent, um, actually, finally, after many trips that I made back and many uh, schemes that he dreamed up, he finally made it to America. And so I had maybe 900 pages of notes telling their stories, but particularly his story, and that was mm -hmm. going to be my next book. And one day I just walked up to my, the living room in our family house in Santa Barbara, and there were 70-foot flames surrounding us from a typical ca California forest fire. Right. And within an hour, the house and everything in it and everything we owned was burned to the ground, including, of course, my notes for the next probably seven years of writing. So the next day, I rang up my editor, who was living in London, and is a wise, kind soul. And I told him, by the way, the book on Cuba, I promised you, it's not going to happen, because I've lost all my notes. And uh, he commiserated for a minute or two. But then he said, you know, actually, that's probably the best possible thing that could happen to you as a writer. And what he was saying was that maybe I was the kind of writer, coming from a journalistic training, who relied too much on notes. Hmm. And that having to write about this place that fascinated, haunted, and preoccupied me, but without any notes, would force me to do it in a much deeper way. Wow. Uh, and he was certainly right. And th the way that played out was that I knew that I couldn't get Cuba out of my mind or out from under yeah. my skin. But I knew I, I couldn't begin a nonfiction book. It'd be too frustrating. And so I actually um, plunged into fiction, which maybe I never would have tried otherwise. Wow. Um, Pico, I wear uh, red. <laughs> yes. Not pink. No, but that, you see, if I didn't take it down now, I might misremember. So. Well, please don't. No, all right. Um, um, I, now I can actually quote you in my story. Thank you, thank you. I didn't tell you I was writing about this, did I? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, what, what was the single hardest piece for you to write and why? Uh, Probably the book that's about to come out um, five, six months from now, which is a hybrid of memoir and biography and initially began as fiction. And it's about Graham Greene and uh, my family and many other things. And it was the hardest to write because, um, as, you can as you know, I was born and grew up in England. Right. And I never used on, in pr print the word I till I was probably 25. And we were learnt never to actually engage with anything to do with the self. But the world is so various and fascinating just to be in sort of impartial camera. We were in taught by the... Invisibly England's by the Eng British system. By the British system. And if you read many of the classic English writers, right, you'll find course. they're as good at recording the world as they're hesitant about writing about themselves. Course, yeah. But finally, after nine books, you know, my editor said, at some point, you've got to actually tell us who you are, where you came right. from, what your family is. So as I was writing about Graham Greene, he kept on, he, my editor, kept on prodding me to say, what is it that's so fascinating to you about Graham Greene? What is it in you that Graham Greene is explaining to you? Why are you turning to Graham Greene instead of writing about your father? And lots of other things right. like that. And so he pushed me actually to, again, into those sort of dangerous areas that I'd avoided, having to do with the people closest to me and, uh, and the parts of me that perhaps I would be keen not to look at. Right. So that was what made it difficult and therefore what made it really interesting. Because I think I'm the kind of person who um, most likes a challenge when I'm writing. And, and, but I'd avoided that challenge until he almost forced me to do it. So um, to write about my father, for whom, like any male, I had you know, mixed and conflicted and complicated right, feelings, right, right. Uh, and um, who is remembered in very different ways by so many people who are still alive. Right. All of that was an, a really difficult challenge, which I probably didn't solve, but at least I addressed, and that was maybe a good thing to do. That's, um, uh, I can't wait. That's fascinating. Um, what uh, what uh, travel writing cliches do you find most Odious. 
These are incredibly good questions. Thank you. Um, write what you know is one, which I think is not a travel writing cliche, right. but that's what you hear. And it's wise advice up to a point. But I'm always more interested to write about what I don't know. Exactly. And to make that writing a way of tunneling into something that intrigues me, but that I can't get my head around. Or to write as a way of knowing. Right. Um, uh, to write as a way of acknowledging how much you don't know. To write about what is mysterious or mystifying. Um, including, in this case, since I was just talking about him, my father. Um, you know, I, to this day, I couldn't figure him out. But that's why probably it's a good thing that I, right. I, I, right. I write about. Um, and, you know, a lot of what I'm saying now, I should, I should especially say to you, has to do with books more than magazine articles. Okay. And if, if I were putting on my journalistic hat, I would be giving entirely different answers to all your questions. And it's one thing that I had to address in my life, making the transition from writing articles to books. Almost everything that works as a, for an article, I had to upend or throw away, including really? the, including oh, the oh. stuff about the notes. Because if I were writing a 4,000-word piece on a southern musician for you, I would want it to be very grounded and concrete and vital, and I would have my notes right there. Right. But if I was writing about that same musician in fiction or quasi-fiction, that's when I'd put the notes across on the other side of the right, road. Okay. And if I were writing for you, you would give me a deadline and I would have to observe it. If right. I were writing for a book, I would try not to have a deadline. Okay. So well, everything is reversed in those ways. So, But ev are you sure about everything? I mean, maybe not these, are, th these, lot, these are some, these are yeah. uh, secondary details, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's true. The things of being attentive, listening, watching, uh, taking care of the sentences, as Mr. Whitworth was saying yesterday, those are in common. But, uh, but, but it is a very, very different practice. And I still, you know, I write them both, and I almost have to go from one person to a very different person from month to month, depending on, on which I'm writing. But, the, you know, one of the good things I learned in journalism was because my, f my only s regular job was with Time magazine. Right. And there I learned that the more I knew about the subject, the more impossible it was to write. About. Interesting. And that's partly because Time magazine has very strict constraints. You only have 800 words. Okay. So if somebody asked me to write about England in 800 words, a country where I spent 21 years, it <laughs> would be impossible. If somebody said write about Little Rock, a place right. where I spent four days, it would be easy and I could probably right. do a much better job. Right, I see what you're saying. And of course that doesn't apply to all kinds of writing, but it was a good thing to be reminded of at an early stage. Right. Um, uh, that, and also it brought me much closer to the reader. If I, somebody then had asked me to write about England, I had 21 years of complicated feelings and experiences. The reader might never have been there. And it would be very hard for me to translate that complication into terms that she could follow. Right. Whereas in Little Rock, I, as a newcomer, a sort of everyman, suddenly arriving and walking through the streets and taking it in for the first time, would be arguably in a somewhat ideal position to lead another person who'd never been here through every, the, the wonder and fascination and unexpectedness of it. And I, that's um, a lesson that I've carried with me through a lot of my writing, which is um, most, nearly everything I've written about is something I don't know about and have never studied. And uh, I think that's not a bad thing because I'm, I'm eager to learn and eager to navigate my way into its complexities the way a reader might be. It sounds exciting to me, the idea of uh, exploring what you don't know versus mm -hmm. uh, just uh, going on and on about what you do know. Um, yeah, and going on and on is a nice way of putting it because it's still the case that opinions and judgments are much less interesting than observations. Right. So when we know something well, we're likely to pontificate about right. it. When we don't know them at all, we're, we're eager to be instructed. And so right. we're taking in the actual facts and figures much more than assuming we know them all. So the, the assumption of knowledge is always a dangerous thing. And even if you're writing about, let's say I'm writing about my father, now, that's a rare topic where I probably do know much more than anybody in right. this room. But precisely because nobody else in this room knows anything about him, I need to kind of clear my head of all that knowledge to be in the reader's position. Uh, you and know, by starting over, might you not learn some new things about exactly. your father? Exactly. That, that's, that's the beauty of the process. By seeing him through a reader's right. or newcomer's or an outsider's eyes, exactly. Um, Freshes and freshens and makes honest your thinking. Because I think I and many of us tend to be kind of locked within our, our prejudices or right. beliefs or whatever. And writing and putting yourself into the mind of the heart of the reader forces you to see the life and the self you take for granted in R different ways. Right. Um. Well, I have this question. Um, how do you know when to trust 
or distrust first impressions? Hmm. I trust them a lot. Uh, and I think 90% of what I write is confirmed by and comes out of first impressions. And when, let's say, I was, saying, I was mentioning how I'll take perhaps 200 pages of notes uh, after a trip and then go back to my desk and try to put them into some order, almost invariably, the, what comes out of the initial trip from the airport into the city and the first few hours I spend in the city, those will be the most valuable. And everything mm. afterwards is really just an annotation or a small amendment or addi an addition to that. And I, I think we're all like that. If, when I met you for the first time and vice versa last year, probably within about five minutes, we'd form some rough sense of who is Mark and who is Pico. And then we're correcting it, and we're, ideally we do get surprised and find out how much right. we're wrong. But by and large, every, I think a huge amount depends on that initial response. Why is that? I mean, are, are we more, are we more uh, intensely open to the new? Yes. And then it's almost as soon as we begin to create responses, that forms a kind of solid, hard core in our heads. And I think we're often, I am at least, often reluctant to start amending that core. We're more keen to just make a few little decorative changes around it. But once I, once after, very, very quickly after I met you, meet you and have a sense of who Mark is, um, then Mark has a place in my head. You, are, you have become a being in my head, and I'm reluctant to throw it out, even if it's completely wrong. E even if you should throw it out. Even if I should, yeah. yeah. Um, which is another reason why it's hard to write about what you know too well or what you think you know. I mean, but is there any, is there any danger in building up these uh, notions of your first impressions? I mean, w uh, aren't first impressions sometimes wrong? And if you're just... Mm -hmm. uh, building them up, I mean, isn't that, especially with, yeah. uh, with the, the, uh, these countries that you go to, yes. you don't know the language, yes. you've never yes. met the people. Exactly. How tricky is that? Well, they are often wrong, and that's not bad either. Um, if I go to L Little Rock, uh, my first afternoon there, and draw lots of wrong conclusions, those may be similar to the kind of wrong conclusions many a typical newcomer, who's biased not in favor or against okay. it, draw. And that you're right, that in some of my pieces, I will use the refuting of impressions as a structure of the article. For okay, example, right. when I first went to Thailand, 1983, the first thing I saw on every side of me were fairly elderly, bulky Western men with very young, very beautiful yeah, Thai right. women. And I thought, this is, this is shocking. Yeah, right. This is Western imperialism, exploitation of an impoverished country. This is, this is how you know, my side of the world, that being the West, comes and tramples over a delicate ancient culture. Right. And after a few days there, when I began to talk to these couples, I found that the young woman was often much happier to be in the partnership than the man was. And she had all kinds of things that she hoped to get out of it, right. or was getting out of it, maybe more than he did. Um, and then I would ask her, why aren't you with a Thai man? And she would uh, offer a withering denunciation <laughs> of <laughs> uh, this man's possible you know, young, handsome Thai rivals. And so quickly I saw that all, all my first impressions were wrong, so I began to form second impressions, and then I began to travel ever deeper into the ambiguity of not knowing what's going on mm. in any relationship, whether it's mine or somebody else's, and not being beginning to be able to say who's in control or who's getting the upper hand or who's taking advantage of whom, which is usually the case in most relationships. And so, you know, traveling through a series of ever less imperfect wrong impressions. <laughs> Um, never, to, never towards a right impression, because I think when I go to a place, when I'm addressing a subject, I usually start with a question, and I don't really expect it to be resolved into an answer. Okay. I just ha hope that it will be replaced by a deeper question and a deeper question and a deeper question. Uh, and that's, that's what, what keeps it alive. S sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I think that's definitely um, one of the reasons that I find your writing so fascinating is that openness. I mean, you, you just do not want to make the snap judgment. And um, that's kind of uh, shocking mm -hmm. uh, in this day and age, I guess. Um, how, how has your writing changed over the years since your first book? Uh, dramatically. Uh, my first book I wrote while playing hooky from Time Magazine. So I was stuck in a 25th floor office in Midtown Manhattan. And Time Magazine made a fatal mistake of giving me a vacation. <laughs> and so I quickly realized it's much more interesting to be walking around Thailand and Burma and Indonesia than 
to be sitting in a cubicle writing about them without having seen them. Right. So I took another vacation, another vacation, and then I said I want to take six months off. And really, I just wanted a vacation to travel around places in Asia I'd never seen. But to justify it, I said, well, I'll write a book about it. So uh, that book, which is pretty long, 373 pages, maybe. Um, I Video I nights in uh, that's right. Kathmandu. So I had to do three four months of travel and the writing of that book. I had to do everything within a six-month leave of absence, wow. uh, including traveling across 10 countries in Asia and then going back to California and writing the book. And because I was in the Time magazine routine, as I was saying earlier, I was used to processing lots of information. Right. I put everything in there, and I wrote it at high speed, which means it's, it's good to be read at high speed, probably. I mean, it's a readable book, I hope, and um, has the merits and the demerits of a magazine article or a series of magazine articles. Uh, whereas now, 25 years on, having kind of exhausted that mode, uh, I try to each book to write in a different way, in a way that I've never done before. So again, as, as I was saying in regard to notes, in that book, if I was describing the hour and a half that we're spending here, I would throw in every single thing I could remember. Right. Now, if I were writing about that, I would probably remember just one piercing moment, which wouldn't be your red laces. But it would be maybe one of these really interesting questions that you're asking me that I still haven't answered and I'm going to think about tomorrow as I fly back to California. I'd realize, well, Mark has set something into motion there that, that I'd never thought of and is really fascinating to me and, and I want to keep tunneling into. And maybe the whole piece would just be that. Mm. Uh, so probably as different as, as it could be. Uh, and that's not always an easy thing for the reader. I mean, because I try to make each book very different from every other book, uh, there, it'd be hard to find a reader who enjoys all my books. If, if she likes one, she'll hate the next. Well, right. uh, but that, that's all right. Um. I think it's all right that you have that attitude. I, don't, I, don't, I, think I haven't found your dad yet. But <laughs> well, uh. actually, I saw it right there, but I won't oh, say which okay, one it right. is. <laughs> um, you know, w one thing that, that, uh, that I think about a lot w with your writing is how you go and you befriend these, uh, you befriend people, you befriend mm -hmm. these um, uh, uh, strangers in, in all s senses mm -hmm. of the word. Mm. And I, I'm not quite convinced that the, the, that process comes naturally to you. Mm. And that um, you, ha you have to, that, that you may have been very shy to begin with and, and it's hard for you to uh, make friends, but you, you Many of your stories uh, revolve around, uh, many of your travel stories revolve around uh, personalities, or mm. involve, I should say, personalities that you've met and befriended. Mm. And um, so why is that a part of your approach of, of, of you know, kind of uh, having a personal relationship with somebody who you end up writing about? I suppose, like most of us, I travel to become a different person and to explore parts of myself I would never see at okay. home. And also, I figure, I, you're right, I'm a fairly shy and reclusive person. I'm an only child. I've always been used to being by myself a lot. And as a writer, I have to spend much of my life alone now. Right, right. So when I travel, I want to do all the things I okay. can't do in my okay. writing part of my life. Uh, and, but I, it's, there's a genuine truth that especially if you go to a closed or an impoverished country, you're instantly the most popular guy in town right. if you come from California right. or the United right. States. Everybody wants to be your friend for a variety of motives that right. you can never figure out. Uh, but I like the fact that a, a relatively um, reclusive person like me is propelled into gregarious right. there, um, quickly has more people around than he knows quite what to do with, okay. with really interesting lives, lives radically different from my own, lives that throw my own into question. So I'm also probably more interested if I meet somebody on the streets of Rangoon and Havana than if I meet somebody on the streets of Santa Barbara. Because in Santa Barbara, I have the illusion I know something about them and right. what their lives are. Right. There, I know nothing about them, and they're unimaginably event-filled, difficult, often joyous, um, mysterious lives. Uh, and I'm interested in, you know, my theme since my first book has been about the exchange of dreams. Right. When an American goes to Nepal, uh, we are often traveling in search of an ancient culture, simplicity, spirituality, everything we feel we don't get in New York City. Right. And, the new, and the Nepali looking at us uh, sees us as an embodiment of Shangri-La or the right. promised land. We come from a land of great uh, uh, freedom and affluence and mobility. And we're 
rich enough to go all the way across the world to visit him. So we, we become dream objects to him as much as he is a dream object to us. And they're both those dreams are kind of illusions in a way, but each is fascinated by what the other represents. Um, and, and so writing about people is a way of first airing and challenging my assumptions about them, and then to see suddenly how when I go to Japan and fall in love with a Japanese woman and think that she is living in the most enlightened culture on earth, she says, yeah, I'd love to be with you, then we can live in California. That's <laughs> the, you know, the epicenter of everything wonderful. And she's, she's right, coming from a Japanese point of view. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think I travel, like mo most of us, to be moved and to be transported. And then finally, to be sent back a different person than the person who left. And all of that is in the domain of, you could say, the emotional, the moral, the psychological. And so that's, that's about people. Um, I, if I go to India, I'm amazed to see the Taj Mahal, but it's not going to change my life. Mm. But the rickshaw driver who's taking me to the Taj Mahal, who's living 24 hours a day in this little rickshaw, who has a collection of every letter he's received from a foreigner, who will say, let's go to my home, and I'm hesitant, and he <laughs> takes me to his home, and he shows me every postcard he's ever received. Suddenly, uh, that is teaching me much more about right. many things than the Taj Mahal would do, and every traveler knows that, that um, it's those, those emotional things that really are the souvenirs that last much more than uh, your photographs or your visual impressions. If I can go back, and this is a bit, we can follow this line, but I, I thought of something good, important I want good. to say in answer to your previous question about how my writing has changed over the years. <coughs> I think the whole nature of writing has been revolutionized in the 25 years I've been doing it by new media. Right. And I really do feel that when I, when I first began traveling, let's say to Cuba or Tibet or Burma or anywhere in 1985, I thought none of my friends or neighbors or readers can ever expect to go to these places. Mm -hmm. So my job is to be their emissary and their voice and their right. ears and their eyes to bring as many sensory impressions back as possible to people so that they can begin to get a feel for those places. And now I know that anybody who reads my books can access online places in Tibet I could never get to, and can have all of Cuba come to her on YouTube with a much greater vibrancy than I could evoke in my prose. So my task, and I think all of our tasks as a writer, is to try to find and then to claim that space that no multimedia instrument can get more Very powerful. Good. And those are spaces in the memory and imagination, in the misremembered fact, in intuition, in silence, in and pause. In friendships. In friendships, yes, but a particular part of the friendship, because there is, okay. a, there is a digicam or tape recorder or other things that can get okay. some aspects of that All friendship. Right. But there's something about how I, back in Japan, think about Mark that, that no camera or recorder could get, and that only writing could begin to lead us into. Right. Um, so there's an in, I think inwardness is part of the territory that writing has to claim now, because the outer sensory world has so brilliantly been covered, and everybody would turn to other devices to get those. Uh, so it doesn't make, it makes our job more interesting in some ways, but we can't be lazy about describing things that are better described elsewhere. Well put. Do you, uh, do you have any fears about um, revisiting some of the countries that you visited pre-internet? Do you have any fears about what they would look like, be like, feel like post-internet? I don't th know that the internet necessarily has changed that texture so much. Uh, I think often I'll go to a place that's very hidden, and 20 years later it's been discovered by the world, and it's lined with hotels and other travelers like myself, and that makes it a different place. Right. But I don't think I can indulge in wistfulness or romanticism about okay. it. it I, I feel it's often like you'll meet a little girl when she's 11 years old and she's completely right. enchanting. Right. 10 years later she's 21 and she's a very different person but you can't resent the fact that she's grown up, and you can't resent the fact that she's had to arm herself to take on the world as an adult. When you re-meet her, um, I, I, it, it doesn't help to say she was yeah. 11 years old once. Uh, and I think that's, that's the same with places, but I also think that's that- That's McLuhan yeah? type thinking, don't you think? Really? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Well, we're, we're both yeah, we're well, admirers and, and okay. students of his, I think. Um, but I, and I also think, though, that we tend to, um, we tend to be more protective of places than we need be. Because uh, I remember when I first traveled, let's say, to, to China or to India or Japan, 
And many of my friends would say, well, they're watching Baywatch and they've got McDonald's and Colonel Sanders on every street corner. Uh, aren't they going to be compromised or corrupted right, or right, lose their soul? Right. And those cultures have been around for two, 3,000 years or more. They've put up with some forces much more formidable than Lady Gaga <laughs> and, um, and Law and Order or The Sopranos or whatever. And they know, as we do, of course, how to take everything that's interesting or that they want from other cultures without ever changing in themselves. And I find in this country, for example, we will routinely get into our Japanese cars to go to the Thai restaurant before right. our, our yoga lesson, <laughs> and yet we're still as American right. as ever we were. So I think a lot of those global uh, Americanizing cultural changes are really on the surface, where all the world is wearing blue jeans now, but all the cultures of the world are just as different as they ever were. And even if they're going into the same Colonel Sanders, Japan and Bolivia and Lebanon are still as far apart as ever, maybe further apart. Th this, that's sort of the great insight, I believe, that you uh, r reported on and earned uh, from your first book, was it not? Maybe so, yes. Um, great, if not insight, but prejudice. I mean, that's my take, and a lot of people feel differently about it, but, but just that it can't be seen too simply. Um, we in America in, are very conscious of we don't like American things very much, and we don't right. want to foist them on the, the rest of the world often. But to the rest of the world, as with my Japanese right. wife, or as with me when I was growing up right. in England, these are rightful things of fascination. Right. And there are many things that America makes better than any country, and that's right. why our pop culture is so strong. We, uh, I love how you make the uh, discussion more uh, complex. Um, why do you travel alone? Why do you try to travel alone? Uh, because as soon as I'm with somebody else, I'm the same person I am at home. And I'm stuck right. in the same okay. routines. Whether, and um, and uh, you know, I, I, I actually tra when I find a wonderful place, I usually take my wife there. And I travel quite a bit with my mother, who just turned 80. Uh, right. And luckily, she's a fairly adventurous mother. So we went wow. to Syria and Easter Island and Cambodia. We're going to St. Petersburg. And so I, I try to choose places I haven't been to before. Wow. Um, but it's a very different kind of travel. And I have one school friend uh, from high school who has the great gift that as soon as he arrives in a country, revolution breaks out, <laughs> guns are on the street, everything goes wrong. He falls mortally ill. And there is never a, a death of drama when he's around. And so I travel with him because <laughs> as, a, as a shameless writer, I know yeah, there's going to be right. abundant material. <laughs> right. And uh, everybody needs such a friend <laughs> in his life. But uh, nonetheless, I'm aware that when I'm with any of those three people, I'm exactly the same person they've known for 30 right. years or whatever. Right. And I'm not meeting the local people as I would. Right. Well, you know, it's an extreme difference. If you're walking down the street alone and if you're with somebody else, as soon as you're with somebody else, people say, Either I don't want to interfere with them, right. or they're take well taken care of, or in some of these countries, well, there's no way of really befriending this individual or marrying right. this individual, right. whatever her intent might be. Uh, so you're really screening off the majority of experience, and you're blinkering your eyes. Because it, when I'm with my school friend, I'm instantly back in the same 14-year-old boy's right. mode. And so I'm, I'm emotionally constrained. Right. I'm, I'm doing the same thing I've always done. And as you said, I, I mean, I was flattered to use the word openness because I do travel um, to, to be taken into those parts of myself I've never <coughs> rolled out before. That's exciting, Kiko. Um, can you talk about the concept of being a, a, a pessimist at home and an optimist abroad? Well, all of us, if we're living somewhere, we're keenly aware of everything that's not perfect about it. And that's why it's so great to have a visitor come, because right. you're suddenly <laughs> yeah. seeing, seeing yeah, your hometown right. through fresh eyes and appreciative eyes. Right. And you're suddenly moved maybe to see and do the things you wouldn't otherwise, that's and true. to be reminded of what a ter terrific place it is. Uh, but it, you know, I was saying a minute ago that we in America feel that American culture isn't the greatest in the world. If you go to Japan, the one culture they're not interested in is Japanese culture, to some degree. Right. Then you go to Syria, and Syrian culture is what they take for granted and find less glamorous and, and romantic. So I like the process of being an outsider, because an outsider is importing fresh eyes to wherever he happens to go. And, uh, and, and I like the fact of going to new places, because instantly that awakens a kind of wonder in me that maybe I forget at home. And ideally, makes me go back to ho home with 
a bit of those fresh eyes. I, and it doesn't last very long, but I always make the resolve, I see. I see. when I go back to my hometown, let me try to look at it for a while as if it were Havana or Easter Island or Beirut. And maybe it'll last four or five days, but that's often enough. I remember a few years ago, um, I took my wife to Tibet because I love it so much, mm -hmm. and I'd been a few times already. And then when I got back to my mother's house in California, I was jet lagged and restless and a little unhappy to have been wrenched out of Tibet and you know, back into a domain that I've known for 45 years. Mm -hmm. So I just got into my car and I drove 10 minutes up the road. She lives up in the hills in Santa Barbara. And very quickly, I was on a road uh, with absolutely no sign of human habitation, wrinkled 4,000 mountains on one side of me, the blue uh, Pacific with the sun scintillant on it on the other, a lake on one th on near the mountains, um, Chumash, uh, ancient uh, uh, Indian drawings in a cave. Mm. And I realized as I was driving down this road, 10 minutes from my mother's house, was more beautiful than anything I'd seen in Tibet. And wow. then if I were to bring a Tibetan there, or in fact, you there, you would be astonished, your jaw wow. would fall open. But I never would have thought to, to either to make the drive or to see it with those eyes until I'd sort of brought back a little bit of that foreigner's traveling perspective. And probably uh, within two weeks, I would have forgotten that these wonders are down the road. But I'm really grateful to try to see the things I think I know with those eyes. I mean, you're making me sound like we have this constant struggle against our innate smallness. Is that... Oh. Is that uh, well, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I mean, that would be a, a good way of summarizing maybe <coughs> why I travel. And, and something you said a few minutes ago about complexifying. I mean, maybe that's why one writes, to complexify the simple. I mean, you want to make it simple in the sense of clarity, as Bill Whitworth was talking about yesterday. But you want to complexify it in the sense of not being satisfied with either your first impressions or your prejudices or your reflex responses. And we all have them about so many things, and writing is a way to tunnel, travel through them and let veil after veil or expectation after expectation fall away. Well, we're scared about the unknown. I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's yeah. built into us for, mm. for survival reasons. But part of traveling, right, is confronting the, the unknown. Mm. Yeah, and because we're scared of the unknown and we're fascinated by the unknown. Right. And that's why we're going to Nepal, uh, because we're fascinated <coughs> by it. And that's why right. the Nepalese want to come here, because they're fascinated right. with this unknown. And I think whenever we're confronted with the other, a part of us wants to run away, and a part of us is ineluctably drawn towards it. Um, it it's, right. it's, it's fascinating and glamorous to us. Uh, so I'm interested in that being torn both ways, in, in that ambiguity, in the, in the way that you know, fear and attraction are tugging us at the same time. Right. Um, and that's why I sort of think of travel as, a, as kind of akin to a love affair, because it's like getting involved with a new person, and a part of you is deeply unsettled, because right. you're going to have to become a different person, maybe, and right. enter a different life. But obviously, a part of you is super excited about this whole new chapter opening in your life. Fascinating. Well, um, I want to ask you, I got a southern question for you, by uh -oh. God. <laughs> um, you, you once said Havana had, quote, all the acquaintance, acquaintance of, uh, uh, of New Orleans without the self-admiration. How exactly does New Orleans <laughs> admire itself? <laughs> I'm glad you didn't ask me about Atlanta. Then I'd really be in trouble. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> so but I'm probably just working on typical outsider's prejudice here. I haven't spent much time in New Orleans. I've been there maybe a couple of times for a few days each. But I do feel that it has a very self-conscious image. It's I a agree. great image. I agree. Um, but it's aware of the New Orleans it wants to peddle to the world. And right. we, going there, are aware of the New Orleans we want to consume. Right. Uh, and it probably doesn't have much to do with the prov impoverished part of town. Right. It probably doesn't have much to do with Zaytun, that great book by Dave Eggers about Syrian people right. living in New Orleans. It's got to do with Bourbon Street, etc. Uh, and so I like the fact that Havana had all that texture and zest and savor, very similar to New Orleans, but oh. it was undiscovered. It wasn't trying to market itself. It didn't know what it had, uh, because the Cubans, when they looked around, only saw dilapidation and they saw the America they dreamed of, and it didn't have many tourists in that way. So it didn't, there wasn't a branded Cuba the way there was a branded New Orleans or a branded LA or a branded New York. But Pico, are you, are you uh, fearful of the future in the sense of, you, know, you, you just referred to Havana as being undiscovered. Mm. The, the implication that I hear is for now. Yes, and yes. 
Um, I mean, the, the population is growing and growing, and, and do you feel in some ways like, you know, you're, you're going to these places because they ain't going to be like that forever. Right. And are, are you fearful that about the future w with regard to uh, uh, undiscovered no. areas? No. And you're right, Havana is going to get discovered. And 20 years from now, it will be lined with McDonald's and Starbucks and uh, The Gap and all of that. The Cuban people, I'm s guessing, will be very much as they are now and as they were during the Batista regime and as they were uh, 100 years ago, right. uh, which is effervescent and irrepressible and spirited. <laughs> and um, uh, as the Chinese people, whose lives I've seen transformed in the 25 years I'm going there, but they're still the same Chinese people, discernibly different from Japanese or Korean or Indian people that, that I know. A place like India is a great example. Uh, it's economically transformed in the last 10 years. It's been discovered by the world. But anyone who's been to India knows India's always going to be the same ungovernable yeah. India. Come yeah. back 5,000 years from now, and India's going to be the same raucous, cheerful chaos it was wow. 5,000 years ago, I really think. I mean, I don't oh. think, I think places are very hard and slow to change, and probably don't change except as with the, the, the yeah, I, I think they change even less than the little girl moving from the age of 11 to 21. Uh, so I'm not fearful, and I think the world is inexhaustible because. Havana will change and become probably more like the United States in the next 20 years. But there'll be other places that are becoming less like the United States or will be becoming stranger. Every year, certain places are being opened to the world and certain are actually being close to the world. Veils are coming down right. over them. So um, everything is in a state of flux. But I wouldn't say it's getting worse. And I would say it's constantly instant interesting. Um. Well, can you talk about the uh, s uh, state of Japan since uh, you live in Japan? Mm. Um, can you talk about the state of uh, Japan in the aftermath of the earthquake? I wish I could, because in a rare show of good timing, I flew out of Japan eight hours before the earthquake. Oh, wow. Uh, the first time in my life, I became the darling of all the media because you know, in the, the day of the earthquake and the following day, lots of editors were thinking, who in the world do we know who's a kind of commentator who lives in Japan? So in quick succession, Time, Newsweek, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, Vanity Fair, huh. 25 different media outlets all came to me and said, tell us what it's like. And I said, it's wonderful here in Santa Barbara. I'm just <laughs> looking out <laughs> over the Pacific Ocean, and it's blissfully. But so I'm afraid I can't tell you. My wife is is currently visiting the US, and she's been there for the first two months after the earthquake, and seems uh, completely un unperturbed, and nothing has changed much um, in her life or in the lives around her. Uh, I had much more panic about the earthquake and the nuclear reactor in California than I ever did in Japan. Uh, they're deeply disenchanted with their government, but it, in my experience, they've always been. Right. Um, and you know, Japan is a society built not around the pursuit of happiness, but the reality of suffering. It's a deeply Buddhist culture. And the idea, and partly it's been around a long time, and there's almost the sense in which I think the Japanese people are always poised for the next calamity. Hmm. They don't expect life to be easy or simple. It's not a culture of happy endings. And hmm. many of them in their lifetimes, whether it's the war or the occupation or, or their 20 years of recession, have had to go through lots and lots of hardship. And that's what they're expecting almost, and that's what they're very, very good at dealing with, whether it's because of, whether it's in the form of their community-mindedness, because people are so kind in Japan and so good at looking after other people's needs, or mm. it's in the sense of their stoicism, or it's in the sense of a deep traditionalism that you will find in most cultures where there's a strong sense of gods. And I think they feel, this is, this is, these are the cards the gods have dealt us this day. This is what we have to deal with. They're not... They're not fighting against circumstance. They're working with it wow. and responding to it. Uh, so, of course, they're, the Japanese they're, way. They're, unsel they're unsettled and traumatized and feel a sense of loss as we do. But at the same time, it's a very strong culture and not going to be thrown off by even that terrible cataclysm, I think. Wow. Um, and you know, those are many of the qualities I went to Japan to try to learn because I admire them so much. Be before I open the floor up for uh, uh, questions, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that um, I asked you how you um, survive as a freelance writer. Because <laughs> that's what you are, right? A freelance yes. writer. Uh, well, you're an editor. So you're the kind of person who's keeping me alive. 
it's really difficult. And of course, more difficult with each passing month. And I was talking to Wes at lunchtime, and he'd seen an interview with me in which I said I do five articles a month. He said, that sounds like a lot. And that interview was nine years ago. And so I was telling him now I'd probably have to do 15 articles a month wow. to survive. Uh, and because my, my support comes from books, magazines, and newspapers, I think of each, each of them as three forms of the Titanic, seeing which is going to sink first. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that to a magazine editor, but they're all uh. obviously in hard times. Uh, and they're all having to cut back, understandably. Right. And one interesting thing is that writers are now being encouraged to be speakers. In fact, you know, to do this kind of right. event more, and therefore not to be writers. Uh, so I'm sure my publishers would be very happy if I spent less time at my desk and more time right. um, out doing events like this. And it's interesting because many people become writers because they love that sense of privacy and quiet and undistractedness in the world right. not disturbing you. And now a writer's job is to spend a lot of his time perhaps doing things for YouTube and doing public events and, and becoming a very different kind of creature. So or they're solitary because they aren't good at being social animals. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting. I mean, I was just thinking this morning how most of the writers we really cherish, we probably cherish because they live so far from the modern swell mm. that they have radically different visions. Right. Whether it's Cormac McCarthy or Thomas Pynchon or Annie Dillard, or Marilyn Robinson, or Philip Roth, or Don DeLillo, to name six of the great American writers right now, all of them are pretty reclusive. Right. And the reason that they change our minds and overturn our minds is because overturn. they're not watching CNN all the time, and they're probably not in this room right now. They're off in some very solitary place, visiting reaches of the imagination that are close to most of us, and bringing them back to us in, in unfathomable and brilliant forms. And so a writer needs to be a long way away from, often, not every writer, because there are many other kinds of writers. Alice Munro or John Updike probably need to be in a room like this to write wonderfully. But so many of the very original visionary writers need to be in their own s sphere, almost. Well, aren't you uh, uh, in your own sphere? I mean, you don't, you don't watch the internet, you don't That's watch right. TV, is that correct? Yeah, and I, I have no, it's a funny thing for a journalist to live without magazines, newspapers, TV, or high-speed internet in rural Japan, in the middle of nowhere. They don't even have a printer, or a, or a bicycle, or a car, or a, or a whole... A bicycle? No, a whole apartment is about barely bigger than the stage. It's very, very small. Is that um, liberating to you? Yeah. Every day lasts an eternity. And it's amazing how, when I wake up, I know, I don't, I've never used a cell phone, I know the phone's not going to ring, <laughs> the nothing is going to tweet. Um, <laughs> every day just Only stretches. Only birds, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so it's as if you wake up and somebody gives you 16 free hours. You can do anything in that time. You can read, you can sleep, you can go for a walk, you can write. You can follow, you can bury yourself in a deep, rich book, and nothing's going to take you out of that book for four hours if you want. You can take yourself into some place in the imagination and pursue it for seven and a half hours, and nothing's going to, you know, nothing's going to beep to take you out of the spell. But it, it this, I, I experimented with it on a much less, lesser level, like by not watching Seinfeld, just so I could, uh, <laughs> just so I could hear all these conversations about it and not know. And it was just kind of pleasurable. I'm, I mean, I actually like that series now, but it was just kind of pleasurable <laughs> to be out of it. Mm. I mean, is that part of it for you too? Is just to be sure. disengaged from yeah. what people are talking about, so you can probe what they aren't talking about. Beautifully said again. Exactly, and it's really luxurious. Uh, it because is luxurious. I, because one does find, I mean, I, I, as much as anyone, when I'm here, I'm talking about the same thing again and again, whatever is in the news. And one thing I find, because I, I don't want to be totally cut off from the world, because right. then that's not human or right. a s sane way to live. Right. So I spend seven months of the year in that seclusion and five months in the midst of the world trying to take it in. But what I do find is I, I go for three-month stretches to Japan and live in this come out, somewhat monastic blackout. And I know that every hour of those three months, there are people shouting on CNN and MSNBC, right. and there are bulletins coming in all the right. time about what's going on with Tony Wiener or whatever. Right. Constant drama, right. round the clock, right. never ending. And I return after three months of absolute seclusion. And I usually have about two hours at San Francisco airport waiting for my right. plane. Okay. So I go to the magazine racks to catch up on the news. Right. What have I missed in three months? And nearly always, I haven't missed a single thing. I mean, everyone's been kept in a state of constant ferment and hysteria, 
up and down, up and down, up and down, and then yet essentially the, the last three months news I can catch up on in 30 minutes. Let's say these last three months, today's the 23rd. So let's say we had been in a blackout since March 23rd. Uh, if we'd lived, if we'd just been in a, in a studio here, in that studio, in this property, and not had any access to the world, and came out like Grip Bang Winkle after three months away since March 23rd, we would find that you know, the bombing with Libya has continued. We'd find a couple of things, but it's amazing how little has happened. But as far as we're concerned, <laughs> we've had an overload of I feel so sorry stuff. for you, Pico. After this, I'm going to take you in the corner, and for a half hour, <laughs> I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about Anthony Weiner, <laughs> and, and, and you will feel that's true. You will feel at you will feel whole. <laughs> it, I mean, yeah, how can you how can you it's exist true. without knowing about <laughs> Anthony Weiner? Well, I mean, I, this is you know, I caught up. I watched TV last night in my room here, and I, I saw a program about Lindsay Lohan's father and uh, and Sean Young going through celebrity rehab. So I'm. Two thirds of the way towards the Anthony Weiner story. Thank thanks, God. thanks to the Rockefeller thanks, Institute. Thanks to the yeah. television. Exactly. In the room. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I hope you all uh, um, understand why I was selfish about getting Pico up here. I mean, th this man is so articulate, so brilliant. He, he I'm, I'm have new thoughts are buzzing through my head already, and um, I'm just so gratified. Uh, to have uh, been able to speak with you. And I would like to open up uh, the, the floor to uh, any questions. I know Kat uh, has a question. So um, Kat, uh, please ask your question. Um, OK, I, I haven't read your, um, the book about your travels and your time stuff with Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. But um, I've studied Buddhism a little bit. And one thing I'm curious about is do you see any ways that Buddhism comes in conflict with like the process of writing? Um, any ways that they're similar? That maybe somebody can be a Buddhist and be a writer and not, you know, feel compelled to write about Buddhism, mm -hmm. but still live in the world. And Thank you. What a beautiful question. For those of you who can hear, it was about whether Buddhism and writing come into conflict or how they can complement one another. And I was I was going to say. I've done a few events like this before, and I've never had such good and thoughtful and sincere questions that I got from you. And that was such a one, I mean, that's perfectly flowing out of yeah. the precedent you set. And I actually wrote a piece about how the more time I spend at the desk, the harder it is to write, because I distrust my thoughts more and more. Because I find what I think at 8 PM, I don't think at midnight, and it's completely contradicted the next day. And so on, which is a kind of Buddhist thing. It's, a, it's almost about meditation, which is the more you soothe, see through your thoughts, the less confidence you can have in any of your thoughts. And then you feel, as a writer, you have nothing to contribute. I would say that the ways in which Buddhism and writing work together, and I shouldn't say this because I'm not a Buddhist myself, but there are wonderful examples, whether it's Leonard Cohen or Peter Matheson, and I've spent a lot of time with both of them as individuals and with both of them in their work. Uh, one of the things that they, I think, for them, writing is certainly a form of meditation. Uh, it's, a, it's a training in attention. Uh, it's a training in impermanence, which I think all are good things to be brought into one's work. Um, and what I first said in answer to Mark, Mark's first question about understanding the world and the clarity that it brings, I find the more time I spend at my desk, the more clearly I see everything. And I think in that way, it's mm. very comparable to what Buddhism is about. And Buddhism, in my understanding, is more than anything about looking at what's real, trying to cut through delusions and illusions and ignorance and, um, and a muddy mirror to clean the window as transparently as possible. And I, I think that's very much what writing is. So that writing, in other words, can be part of Buddhist practice, I think, and a wonderful way of doing it in a very physical, constant daily discipline. The way that they go against one another most, I would say, is that a part of me thinks Buddhism is about cutting through the self, I think. And as the years go on, the more I think to be a writer, you need actually a very sturdy sense of self. You almost need quite a strong ego to have the confidence to inflict your vision on the world. Uh, and I think when I was mentioning some of the writers that, that, are pop, that you know, we revere in America, Today, we revere them because they're so distinct, and they wouldn't 
maybe it would be hard for them to be equally distinct if they were selfless or if they had no interest in their own ideas and, and prejudices and opinions. Uh, so that's an interesting conundrum because I think I, I read the Buddhist magazines often and I think a lot, there are so many wise Buddhist teachers but most of them are not very good as, as writers. <laughs> uh, and there are a handful of Buddhist writers who are wonderful at both and Jim Harrison would be another one, of mm. course Gary Snyder, Allen Ginsberg, I mean this country has a, has a, a rich collection of them who found a way to, to bring the two was together. Isherwood? Isherwood was a Hindu, but he oh, would be a great right. example and because he uses Hinduism as his, his theme, okay. more or less. Okay. And I think okay. Leonard Cohen, to me, is the ultimate example because he's so much in the world and yet all he's writing about is death and suffering and uh, impermanence. So mm. heroic stuff mm. to be taking on. Uh, but it, it certainly makes for a very interesting challenge. Just last year, I discovered a wonderful Buddhist writer called John Tarrant, and he's from Tasmania. And what's interesting about him is he grew up on three things, Jungian psychology, the Catholic mass, and English literature. And yet he's now um, a Zen master and a Zen teacher. And he's written two books. One is called The Light Inside the Dark, and one is called Bring Me the Rhinoceros. Uh, and he writes like a poet, and every, of his, every one of his sentences has the bottomless stillness and clarity of a kind of Zen koan. Wow. And yet it's also about very human things, about your mother dying and your house burning down and your best friend turning to you for advice. And um, he somehow has brought it together. So I recommend um, his book strongly. But I'm guessing that you, as, as a writer and as a Buddhist, are thinking about the challenges that bring the two. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that took me to Japan was it's a great culture of silence. Mm -hmm. And what they're really good at is listening to other people. And when you're in a Japanese conversation, people are never pontificating the way I am now or foisting their ideas or designs or agendas on you. They're just listening and taking in everything you say. And that's something I so much revere about them. And I went to learn, having grown up in England and this country where you're trained to talk quite a bit, but of course, it makes it hard to be a writer. <laughs> Either you write haiku or very, very compressed things, or you feel, what's the point of all the words? <laughs> and probably the longer I'm in Japan, the more I feel that. And that's one way to answer your question. My writing has changed. It used to be very garrulous and probably mm. rather speaking from my Indian ancestry. And now what was 60 pages, I'll try and put into 60 words. <laughs> so it's become Japanese. But if I continue along that road, 60 words will become 60 syllables and then <laughs> it'll evaporate entirely. So um, I think Japan has taught me the virtue of everything that can't be said. Um, but thank you. What a great question. I've never, never Does anybody had to else ask have it. a smart question? Yes. <laughs> oh, come on. It's um, <laughs> I was wondering if you have through and retraced um, <coughs> the Great Railroad Queen's recently for his Ghost Train book. I was wondering if you ever think about sort of 20 years since video night. Um, so the question was, Paul Theroux recently recreated his famous journey from um, Great Railway Bazaar and wrote Ghost Train to the Eastern Star, whether I would think of revisiting my first book called Video Night in Kathmandu and go back to those 10 Asian countries 25 years later. And in some ways I've done that in, in small, uh, for example, I've been to Thailand 60 times now and I've been to Japan yeah, I live in Japan now for the last 24 years, so I'm constantly revisiting those subjects, but I don't think I would do it in book form. My second book uh, was called The Lady and the Monk, and it was about my first year in Kyoto when I fell in love with a woman and a culture and a way of life. And I think I may well actually write, revisit Japan after 25 years there. Uh, and that would be an interesting contrast. Again, contrasting the wide-eyed, foreigner just escaped from a 25th floor office who's entranced by everything in Japan with the person who's in the thick of it and reporting a bit from the inside out and with some of the illusions gone. How yeah. will the place that so transfixed me my first year there seem after 25 years there? So yeah. I may well do a version of it that now. But because as I was saying to Mark, my writing has changed over those year these years. I think writing in the way that I wrote my first book is less appealing to me. So if I did revisit those countries, I would try to write about them in a radically different way. I think Paul's writing has remained, to some extent, 
his nonfiction is very much the same. If you take his 1974 book and his 2009 book, and you read them side by side, you would see a few mellowings and differences in sensibility, but you would see it's very much the same person. Though his fiction has changed dramatically and changes every few years. Um, but my nonfiction has probably changed a lot, so it'd be hard to revisit. Um, and, I, and again, I wouldn't have faith in the enterprise. Then I thought, what a great thing to spend three months in 10 countries and writing them all up in three months. And now <laughs> I, I wouldn't, be, wouldn't be able to persuade myself that was a useful <laughs> thing to do. Anyone else? Well, we will conclude um, this, and I will just thank you again, Pico. I think you are an amazing writer. I, I definitely think you all should pick up one of his books and experience him in the solitude of your own head. Um, this man is an important writer, and I'm so glad that you came up here. Thank you so much, Pico. Oh, I'm really thrilled. Thank you. Thank you.